and it, we just couldn't add an angle on it. We just had to wait for him to move because you know, we were at a point that if we move, he was going to detect us. Their preparation and patience pays off. The rhino finally starts to move out of the thick brush, but instead of going forward, he comes right toward them, hunter and hunted, eye to eye, less than six yards away. He started feeding and he started feeding straight towards us. So we were sitting tight, hoping until the last minute that he would give us a broadside shot. And I actually took one of my bullets and threw it to distract him to turn so we can get a broadside shot on it. But he just lifted his head and just came straight. Only because of Nadi's quick thinking and that was he able to spook the bull and the bull run short ways, confused because we were on our hands and knees and he couldn't figure out what we were. For a North American bow hunter who has ever been yards away from an enraged bull elk, imagine being six paces away from three tons of unstoppable rhinoceros. And when he was six yards away, I mean, there was no point we had to do something, so I just got up to let him know we're there and he can turn off. And we almost got a shot then because he just, he didn't know what was happening. He never knew we were there. And he just took off for about 10 yards and stopped. I, I, I remember I was shaking after that close encounter. And now I thought, can I get this 90 pounds back now? And can I pick that small spot that I got to find on that great big body? 6,000 pounds, it's like a garage standing, a Volkswagen bus standing in front of you, but you're looking at a vital area that's only the size of a football. Nadi feels the white rhino is the most difficult African animal to kill with a bow and arrow. With its one inch thick skin, the rhino resembles an armored vehicle. His ribs are approximately one inch by two inches and close together, making penetration extremely difficult. Well, I think it's more, um, you have to have the perfect broadside angle because there's no way on the right, the, if you can hit him 90 degrees, I think you're gonna get the best penetration. Gary is ready with his 90 pound Hoyt Deviator bow. The Rhino is about 30 yards away. The specially prepared Easton AC-371 arrow, tipped with a two blade Thunderhead broadhead, is well aimed and true to the spot. Well, the arrow was well placed and we had good penetration. After six exhausting days, their patience was rewarded. The rhino was struck by a perfectly placed arrow. Right now, I'm a bundle of nerves. Fortunately, it doesn't take long for the team to track the rhino down. Gary is not without emotions. The six days have been extremely difficult, both mentally and physically. Such a good guy. Even now, with his first success, he has concerns for those who would question his taking of such a magnificent animal. The concept that hunting provides protection is difficult for some hunters to fully understand. You've invaded his world. You got within his inner circle, and you did everything correct. And you harvested a magnificent animal. In his heart, Gary knows that the taking of the old bull is an important part of wildlife conservation and the preservation of the white rhino. The fact that we were allowed to is because the white rhino is not in danger. There are plenty of animals. Uh, the animals are available by permit only and by CITES permit. In the bush, it takes six men to skin the giant rhino who in his prime could eat over 150 pounds of grass and vegetation a day. The black rhino is the animal that is near extinction. That's the animal that's being sought for its horn, its numbers are dwindling, and it's because very little's being done by our society to preserve it. Today in South Africa and elsewhere, Man is encroaching on the wild animal's habitat, pushing them deeper into the bush. And ready for the inevitable shot. Realizing that he was facing a four to 500 pound male lion, capable of taking down a 2,000 pound cake buffalo, of tearing his prey apart with a swipe of his claws, 
or crushing a man with a single bite. Yeah, he knew we were there, but he was deciding, should he give up? But he knew the minute he would leave, those vultures are going to come and take his impala kill. The passing minutes seem like hours. After leaving the kill twice, the lion finally returns and presents the perfect shot opportunity. Gary sends the arrow perfectly towards the king of the jungle. The arrow hits with such force that it passes right through the lion. He leaped in the air. He ran about 50 to 70 yards and he was done. But what was, what was really amazing is after about 10 yards, you could already see he was lo losing blood pressure simply because his back end was starting to sway. And he made another 50, 70 yards and he was down. I was amazed then at the, even the blacks. My trackers, the first day we went out and we only had bows, they weren't too concerned until they found out that Gary had never the rifle. That's the only thing he had was a bow. <laughs> and um, they weren't convinced until the lion. And after the lion, they didn't care whatever comes in front, they knew the bow could do it. Thank you, Hans. Back in camp, the natives fully realize the power of the bow as they each try to draw the bow. None are successful. Such is the case with the leopard. Bait is placed high in trees and camouflage to keep the vultures away. Yeah. Blinds are built and the waiting game begins. Well, with the leopard, um, as with the lion, we chose that time of the year um, because it's hard for the cats to make their kills. So generally, during July in the Salu Game Reserve, um, that's the optimum time to get the cats on bait because they really are hungry. The distance, as well as the fact that it will be turning dark soon, will pose challenges to Gary's bow hunting expertise. The leopard was an animal that I had been really concerned about. He's fast, he's cagey. Leopards are usually hunted at night with lights. But in Tanzania, Gary has to hunt in daylight. Late that afternoon, a leopard surprises them with an almost unheard of early appearance. The leopard hunts mostly during the night and has well-developed senses of smell, sight, and hearing. I normally would put a blind maybe 50 yards from the bait with a rifle because it just gives you that much more chance that the leopard's not going to detect you. But this is no ordinary hunt. Now with the bow, you know, we had to get him within 30 yards or closer. So that's just another thing that made it much more difficult. And the difference between 30 yards and 50 yards it sounds like, you know, only 20 yards, but that 20 yards is absolutely crucial. Gary is having difficulty controlling his shakes and is worried that the leopard will hear him. He realizes that the slightest movement or sound from him or any team member will jeopardize the entire operation. The dangerous part about leopard hunting is it's a very small target. You're sitting in the blind for hours. All of a sudden, it's like a ghost. You open your eyes and the leopard is there. The mentally fatiguing part of a long African hunt can be as hard to handle as the physical demands. When you sit there and you wait, and all of a sudden, like mystically, there's the leopard. I mean, he's, he's right there in the tree and he's looking right at you. In his present position in the tree, the leopard doesn't present an angle for a shot. Gary prays for help to quit shaking. You would not, you would not have a second shot with a, with a bow and arrow. You'll have one shot and that'll be it. Your next shot will be when he's charging. Then the unexpected happens. The piece of meat which the leopard has taken from the bait drops to the ground. If he decides to go after it, he will come too close to the blind which increases the chances of being exposed. But again, luck is in their favor. Instead of going down, the cat returns to the bait. The blind we used had a screen in front of it designed to be shot through it. You know, that helps that the animal can't see you inside the blind if you should move. Um, 
I wasn't worried about it before until at the time of the leopard actually appeared. And then that screen almost, you know, looks double as thick as it was. Um, but, you know, we had no choice. If we had movement at that time, the leopard would be gone. So we decided to go ahead and um, Gary shot through it and it worked perfect. Wagner's perfectly tuned hunting gear proves its worth. The eastern arrow goes straight through the leopard and into the tree. I put the pin right on the shoulders and I never hesitated and I let release the arrow. And the arrow went right through the mosquito netting and right through the leopard. You know, the was fun part was we watched him for 30 minutes before we made a shot at him. We had to wait again for him to stop moving, you know, present himself perfectly. Whereas with a rifle, maybe after four or five minutes, we could have shot. Good, let me Noddy has had much experience with wounded leopards. He and Patty have their 12-gauge shotguns loaded and at the ready. If a leopard is wounded, he'll go to stuff that as thick as possible that he can find. And secondly, his speed. I mean, the speed of a leopard charging is just unbelievable. There's nothing like the speed of a leopard charging. The leopard went less than 30 yards before expiring in the heaviest brush it could find. Afterwards, Gary had a chance to reflect on his emotions. It's like smoke, and he was there. Again, your heartbeat goes from here whoo, to here. You got your leopard. After 21 days in the bush, the team has had a roller coaster ride of emotions, and the quest is only half finished. They have yet to conquer the Cape Buffalo, Hippo, and Elephant. All big, all dangerous. That night, as the team returns triumphant to camp, the natives once again celebrate the efficiency and power of the bow and arrow. You know, and that's the other thing about bow hunting. With a rifle, should it in charge, you and your client will fire. With a bow, the bow is not going to do any good. So if you have to shoot an elephant charging, you lose it because it's not a bow kill anymore. Because of the position of the vital organs of the elephant, the best shot placement would be just behind the front leg and above center. The elephant's skin is not as thick as the rhino and hangs very loose over oval-shaped, wide-spaced ribs. A lot of times when you hunt elephant, um, especially if there's a couple of them, you might have to get very close to some of them in order to get a shot at the one you want. And that's just that much more difficult with the bow because you have to get that much more closer. Keeping this in mind, they gradually move down the river and try to position themselves for a possible shot when the animals cross the sandy riverbed. We watched them for a long time before one finally presented that right opportunity. Naughty has gotten them within the deadly inner circle, into the elephant's personal space. If the animal is alert, I would not shoot him. I'll wait until he's calm, until he's feeding, and then shoot him. Because I think um, just his reaction, if he doesn't expect it, he won't go far. Because he, you know, he doesn't know what happens. Whereas if he's alert and he's expecting something, as soon as the arrow hits him, he's gonna take off. It takes all of Gary's strength to draw the 90-pound bow. The months of strenuous physical training pays off as he takes careful aim at a mass the size of a truck. I looked at that elephant. I remember when I pulled the bow up and I put, I tried to put the sight, and there was elephant all around the sight, all the way around it. And I said, where do I, where's the right spot? <laughs> The arrow is away, well placed, and totally disappears into the massive chest. He came right straight to us. Um, he didn't really know where we were. And we just stood as long as we could. And I, w you know, sometimes that's one thing with bunting. You wait longer than you would normally with a rifle hunter. When the arrow struck the elephant, he, he never knew what happened. He probably caught a mosquito dirty. Yeah, he's just, he's just
a li just a little short distance is all. The 10,000 pound bull elephant turns just before reaching the group. And luckily it turned and you know, it was about 15 yards when he finally turned and then he didn't run far. Uh, we followed him up and he, you know, he was getting sick and he didn't know what, what was happening with him. Again, fate would deal a blow to the party. Darkness settled in and the elephant herd moved into very thick brush and surrounded the dying bull. Naughty and the government game scout agreed it is a very dangerous situation that requires waiting for morning light to retrieve the bull elephant. Rising before dawn and ready to go at first light, the team begins tracking through thick brush. After a difficult search, they find that the old bull elephant had expired during the night and was now partially destroyed by scores of hyenas and vultures. Nature once again shows her way. Upon examining the animal, they found that the arrow had passed almost completely through the elephant, erasing any doubts that the bow and arrow lacked the penetrating power needed to take an animal of this size. A recent vote by CITES, the UN Wildlife Convention, recognized the fact that elephant populations vary from country to country. In some areas, oversized elephant herds are destroying natural vegetation, forests and crops and threaten the lives of rural peasants. Hunting is now regarded as one of the best ways to control the overpopulation of elephant herds. If you approach them, especially sometimes you approach them without knowing it, and they'll charge without thinking about it. I mean, so they have a very aggressive nature. Gary is well aware of the aggressive nature of the hippo, who stands five feet at the shoulders and can weigh over 4,000 pounds. All it takes is one bite. I found the hippo to be extremely challenging. Very, uh, when you talk about tusks this big around and they come together in a slicing action like this, one bite and he's gonna bite you in two. He's quick on his feet, very quick. Uh, he's got a good nose. Uh, we had a number of close encounters. Naughty got us within, my word, distance at one point, 15 yards from a hippo. You could see the bugs crawling on him. We were lucky, we got very close to him and he was just dozing and having fun in the water. And the biggest thing about that was he didn't know what happened when Gary's arrow hit him. And he was looking at us, but he wasn't sure. He didn't think we were people. I mean, at that point, something struck him and he just wasn't sure what happened. That's why you would see Gary just frozen. I just told him not to move um, because at that point, should you move, you know, and he would, he would actually see that it's a human, there's no doubt he will charge. I dropped and held my breath and at one time he was spitting uh, water and snorting and I thought he was coming. And he looked around and didn't see anything, I guess. And he turned and just started walking and then trotted a little bit and he trotted off not very far and expired. I think when you bow hunt, when you bow hunt in Africa, it's like going back to the old Africa. Um, you take up the new challenges, you take up the challenges like it was the old Africa. And it just makes everything that much more difficult, that much more challenging. The camp staff is once again able to use the meat from the trophy, including hippo patties for dinner one evening. I like the bowl because we had to get closer. We had to invade that circle, that environment, without that animal knowing we were there.
Well, that's the thing about the buffalo. All his senses is good. You know, the rhino can't see well, but he can hear and smell well. The buffalo has got everything. And he's got the character to go with that. Once he's hurt, he's not in a good mood. Buffalo have a reputation for being one of the most dangerous of the African species to hunt. When wounded, they've been known to circle and stalk their hunters, lying alert in the bush and charging forward at close range without warning to gore, stomp, and crush to death the hunter. The risks are multiplied when bow hunting. We got into, there was a lot of mud and water, but we, I don't care if there was crocodile, nothing was gonna stop us from getting those buffalo. We went through that and we got close enough to them that uh, Gary could finally place a good arrow in the buffalo. Naughty and Gary begin the stalk across the marsh, not knowing what lies beneath the surface of the water. We started out to the edge of the marsh and we had to figure out how are we going to get out across this marsh uh, and through this water. And Naughty never hesitated. He says, we're going out across there. And I looked at it and I thought, there could be crocodile. Uncertainty and fatigue are setting in. But Gary pushes on, encouraged by Naughty. We went through that and we got close enough to them that uh, Gary could finally place a good arrow in the buffalo. Gary's heart rate is over 140 beats per minute. I can remember my heart was racing. I can remember I was even shaking. And it took everything within me to get that pin to hold still long enough on the right spot before I released the arrow. Driven hard and fast by the Hoyt bow, the Easton ACC arrow reaches its mark and the buffalo reacts immediately, running off into the thick brush. Knowing how dangerous a wounded buffalo is, they wait, as all bow hunters should, before following the buffalo's track. The native trackers are quick to pick up the buffalo's spoor. The fall of the buffalo is the final chapter in the team's adventure and Gary's lifelong dream. Once again, the harvested meat will be consumed by the camp. That night, there is a celebration and a special feeling of pride in successfully taking the African Big Six with a bow and arrow, a feat never before accomplished.